Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You may know by now that we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a series for the first three months of 2015 on the Pro Book of Proverbs. This particular lesson is lesson number three in that series entitled, A Matter of Life and Death. That sounds pretty serious. This is the lesson for January 17 of 2015. We hope you have your Bible handy because we'll be looking at a number of passages, not just in the book of Proverbs, of course, mainly in the book of Proverbs. But uh, if you have your Bible handy, and I guess even if you don't, would you be willing to bow your heads with us as we ask the, God, the Lord to guide us in our study? Our loving Father, we now look at one of these books described in the Old Testament as books of wisdom. Books that are a lot of poetry in them, a lot of witty sayings and so forth, and yet some pretty serious messages. Help us to understand what we're studying, to present it in a way that's helpful to those who listen is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How often do we face life and death situations? Is that, um, I mean, it depends on what you call a life and death situation. I guess driving down the freeway is a life and death situation. Walking outside your house. <laughs> could happen and you can walk outside your house and somebody can knock you off or whatever. But uh, we are, normally don't think of ourselves as facing frequent life and death situations. But Proverbs here, and particularly Proverbs 6 and 7 that we're studying for today, talks about a life and death situation. And let's just put the, the facts out on the table to start out with. Some of Satan's most successful temptations are temptations that he has made out of natural desires, natural tendencies, which God designed to be used for good purposes, and Satan has twisted them a little bit to make them very subtle and very powerful temptations. And that's, um, that's a little worrisome. Um, Jesus commented about it. Look at Matthew 5, starting with verse 21. You've heard that people were told in the past, do not commit murder. Anyone who does will be brought to trial. But now I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother will be brought to trial. Whoever calls his brother good for nothing will be brought before the council. And whoever calls his brother a worthless fool will be in danger of going to the fire of hell. Is that a life and death matter? Sounds like it, doesn't it? So if you're about to offer your gift to God at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go at once and make peace with your brother and then come back and offer your gift to God. If someone brings a lawsuit against you and takes you to court, settle the dispute with him while, you, while there is time before you get to court. Once you are there, he will hand you over to the judge, he will hand you over to the police, and you will be put in jail. There, will be, there you will stay, I tell you, until you pay the last penny of your fine. And then turning to verse 27, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But now I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman and wants to possess her is guilty of committing adultery with her in his heart. So if your right eye causes you to sin, take it out and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose a part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is much better for you to lose one of your limbs than for your whole body to go to hell. Those are pretty solemn comments. Um, and by the way, what do they have to do with Proverbs 6 and 7? Well, Proverbs 6 and 7 talk about the, uh, problem, the, the, the enticements of women who are uh, seductresses, it sometimes calls them, uh, prostitutes, harlots, and so forth. The issue of how many men and women should, how men and women should relate to each other is illustrated well by how Jesus related to people in his day. He was so gracious even to flagrant sinners. Can you think of an example? The lady at the well. The lady at the well is one. Can you think of another example? The woman taken in adultery. The woman taken in adultery, John 8 and then John 4. Um, 
He felt comfortable talking to them and talking about them. And yet, to understand how incredible that was, in contrast to the thinking of his day, consider these words from Barclay's commentary. But there was still another way in which Jesus was taking down the barriers. The Samaritan was a woman. The strict rabbis forbade a rabbi to greet a woman in public. A rabbi might not even speak to his own wife or daughter or sister in public. There were even Pharisees who were called the bruised and bleeding Pharisees because they shut their eyes when they saw a woman on the street and so walked into walls and houses. <laughs> that would be very interesting to watch, huh? It would be even more dangerous today, wouldn't it, with <laughs> yes. cars zipping by? For a rabbi to be seen speaking to a woman in public was the end of his reputation. And yet Jesus spoke to this woman. And she was what? She was a Samaritan. She was a woman. She was a woman of very dubious reputation. No decent man, let alone a rabbi, would have been seen in her company or even exchanging a word with her. And yet Jesus sat down and spoke with her. What does that tell us? What we do know, however, from other passages and other information is that what the Pharisees did in private was very different from what they wanted themselves to, how they wanted themselves to be seen in public. Can you give some specifics of that? <laughs> well, how did, they, how did they trap the woman taken in adultery? They caught her red-handed. It wasn't by accident they caught her red-handed. They set that up. They, of course, were trying to trap Jesus. That's exactly what they were trying to do. Was it one of them that Very likely. was with her? Very likely. And furthermore, the better illustration perhaps is the fact that Jesus, in that illustration in John 8, he, what does he do when they keep pressing him? He bends over and he starts writing things in the dust on the pavement there at the temple. Now, we don't know exactly what he wrote, but it's very likely he wrote to specific instances, incidences when these people were involved, perhaps even with this very woman, because in a very short period of time, they started looking down and they disappeared. And the key part of that is beginning with the eldest. So this was not a case of, you know, generally, you know, you guys are a bunch of sinners and therefore you shouldn't be accusing this woman. These were specific sins he was writing and they, they left. And we know that when it was over, not a single one of them was there to criticize the woman. So why did Jesus write that in the dust? Why didn't he write it on the wall? It, it was it, with his finger in, 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 in the, the, in the in, 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 engraved in the marble, right, of the, of the wall? Yeah, good question. Good question. He was incredibly gracious to sinners. That's the only possible explanation you can give. Even so a moment later, no one, no one would know what, uh, what those sins were. With written in the dust, a few footprints, a few puffs of wind, and the, all the evidence would be gone. Well, <clears throat> we, we come now to the next section in our study. We, know, we all know and understand the fact that the law defines sin. And let's look at just a couple of places here. Probably the best known place, and I'm not going to read it, obviously, is Exodus 23 to 17, where we find the Ten Commandments, right? Romans, by Paul, says in Romans 7, verse 7, Shall we say then that the law itself is sinful? Of course not. But it was the law that made me know what sin is. If the law had not said, do not desire what belongs to someone else, I would not have known such a desire. So, what is sin? Lawlessness. Lawlessness. Now you're quoting from 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Very good. Sin is lawlessness, rebellion. The yes. traditional translation, sin is transgression of the law in that same verse. Transgression of the law in the King James Law Version. Lawlessness in the modern translations. Yeah. It's interesting to notice that in Proverbs 31, God says, I don't want my law just to be written on tables of stone somewhere. I want to write it on your hearts. How does that work? Do you 
Uh, sure. Is he going to crack our chest open like a chest surgeon and do something to the muscle in there? What do you think? Yeah, you absorb it into your mind. You absorb it into your mind, into your thinking, into your way of, yeah. of living, actually, yeah. right? Your whole persona. Mm -hmm. In Christ Object Lessons, a very familiar passage that we've talked about a number of times in this class, the bottom of the page 97, the top of page 98, it says, those who really keep the law do what is right because it is right. Would that be a case of having the law written on your heart? Desire of Ages, page 668, goes even further and it says, if you really get to know God and His law becomes a part of you, then sinning will become hateful to you. Hateful to you. How many of us have reached the place where sinning is hateful to us? Well, if we, if we, if we could reach those standards suggested by Christ's object lessons and desire of ages, would that represent having the law written on our hearts? How do you reach those standards? Yeah. That's, well, it suggests, it suggests in Desire of Ages that by looking to Jesus, by trying to copy Him, by thinking about Him, by focusing on Him, that's, that's what it talks about. I'd like to put Romans 2.14 in there also. Yeah. When, th when those who do not have the law do what the law requires, so that the law is written on their heart. Yeah. They do what's right. Very good. Very good. Well, now, and then again, yeah. what is the fulfilling of the law? Love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now coming to our main chapters that we're studying for today, we've already looked a little bit at chapter 6 in previous lessons. Look at chapter 6, verse 21. Keep their words with you always, locked in your heart. So we talked about God writing something on your heart. How would you keep their words locked in your heart? And a few verses further on, in chapter 7, verse 3, it says this, Keep my teaching with you all the time. Write it on your heart. Does that give us a clue about what Solomon and, 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 and Jesus were trying to tell us? Well, do we need a little more help? Look at Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9. Maybe this will help us. Deuteronomy 6, starting with verse 4. Israel, remember this. The Lord and the Lord alone is our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Never forget these commandments that I'm giving you today. Never do what? Don't forget them. Never forget these commandments that I'm giving you today. Teach them to your children. Repeat them when you're at home. And when you're away, and when you're resting, and when you're working. If we did that, would they become very familiar to us? Would they become a permanent part of our thinking? Tie them on your arms and wear them on your foreheads as a reminder. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. And if we had time, we would turn over to Deuteronomy 17, where it says, The king should make a copy of the law, and he should read this every day. Now, of course, that was in the days when not many people had the ability to read, but at least the king would have that ability, or he would have someone ascribe, read it to him. Think how different things would have been in the history of both northern Israel and southern Judah if the kings had done, taken that advice and, and followed it. In Deuteronomy 6, where you read about mm -hmm. that on the doorposts and hanging mm -hmm. on your wrists and so on, did Moses mean that literally, or was that a figure of speech? Well, that's a good question. Uh, obviously, you're thinking about if you go to Black trees. to Black Jewish trees. place in New York City or down in Houston, or especially if you go to Jerusalem, they will show you how to put those phylacteries on your arms, and it's a very extensive process, and then you put, put one on your head up here and wrap it around and so forth. I don't think that's what Jesus had in mind. Look at these words. Jews, Muslims, and Christians have taken this idea and worn symbols of their beliefs around their necks, around their arms, and even on their foreheads. Crucifixes, phylacteries, and prayer beads, sometimes called worry beads, are not going to save anyone. 
These ideas were to be taken symbolically to mean that just as the neck and throat are the means by which we take in nourishment and air, the eyes and the ears should be guarded against taking wrong things into our brains. So it doesn't sound like, if that at least that's a suggestion, we're talking about literally putting things on our arms or on our foreheads. It's interesting to notice in that context that how did the what did the cross originally mean? Talking about a Christian symbol. Terrible. It was an awful symbol. It was about the worst thing you could possibly think of. This was this was reserved as the worst kind of torture and punishment, the worst possible way you could kill somebody if they were a traitor to the Roman government. So now we have something that was originally a terrible sign, a sign of a traitor to the government, has now become a Christian symbol, supposedly, and representing the fact that this person who's wearing it is uh, adhering to all Christian principles. Of course, we know it doesn't quite work like that, does it? So, our challenge in this lesson is to find ways that we can write God's laws on our minds and hearts so as to avoid some of Satan's most pervasive temptations. Proverbs suggests that we can do that by keeping the law ever before us. It is like a light. Proverbs 6.23 is an example. It says, their instructions are a shining light. Their correction can teach you how to live, talking about the words of God. And the very famous verse, Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to guide me and a light for my path. So in what sense is God's word, God's directions, a light? What is implied by that? Well, you could take it literally in that it's a light to show you what path you're on. Mm -hmm. Can you think about some examples in the Bible where people said, this is God's way, I'm going to walk in it no matter what, and they, they did it despite facing some terrible um, consequences, at least theoretically. Daniel. Was, Daniel? In the, he was in the lion's den. Well, uh, how he got in the lion's den, he, he said, I'm going to open my window and I'm going to pray to God three times no matter what, three times a day no matter what. And where did he end up at? In the lion's den. Can you think of another example? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A few chapters earlier in Daniel 3. And what were they doing? Told not to, excuse me, they were told to bow down or whatever it is. At the they were supposed they, to bow down to the, to the symbol of King Nebuchadnezzar, and they did what? Stood. Stood. They stood up straight. And the king, beca king became so angry, he said, I'm going to do what? Put them in the furnace. Make the fire seven times hotter and throw them in there. And, of course, we know that their lives were preserved. I was wondering about your no matter what thing. Um, yes. That, that could either mean I'm going to do it stubbornly or I'm going to do it because there's no what that will tell me that I shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so which do you think this is? I think it's the one that says that um, there's no what to tell me not to do it. Okay. I, um, do you think that uh, people study the Bible to be stubborn? I hope not. I, I hope people study the Bible because they enjoy studying the Bible. Well, I hope they study it because they like the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, well, um, and they want to learn about God. Yeah. Yeah. What about Joseph? Do you think he had any idea what he might be up against when uh, he refused to sleep with Potiphar's wife? Yeah. That was He'd, between a rock and a hard place. No matter what he would have done, he would have... Yeah. Well, you know that you know that if Potiphar really had believed that he was guilty, he would have, he would have lost his life. Yeah, that was the, the law as it was. That's in Genesis 39. Well, look at Proverbs 
7 verse 2. Um, some of the more tra water translations, well, let me just pick one of the more traditional ones. I'll go to the New American Standard Bible for 1995. Keep my commandments and live, and my teaching as the apple of your eye. What's the apple of your eye? Well, I think it's the most important part of what you see out of to see what's going on. The pupil. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think I think if you look at a box of apples and you want to have an apple, there's going to be one that your eye is going to go to that you're going to get. I see. That's, that's your apple. I see. Hey, that's I think the apple it's something more precious than that. It's an yeah. old English saying that yeah. goes back centuries, the apple of your eye, and probably other countries But isn't do. that what you do? You find the apple of your eye. It's the one you want. That, You're that, taking that it too literally. Yeah, that metaphor is not used literally. <laughs> but it could be your favorite child. There's no, it could I, be I, what, a variety yeah, but, of meanings. Yeah, but it's still a metaphor. It's still a metaphor, but you got to... A metaphor always has some real aspect to it to mm -hmm. become a metaphor. Well, <clears throat> I, I think it's time for us to get down to where the rubber meets the road. Proverbs 6 and 7, taken literally, are warnings against sexual promiscuity, right? No. Uh, we, we don't. But it only seems to address women because in 6 there's a place where it says, um, you know, it's okay, if go get, if the prostitute, you could get a prostitute for a price of a no bread, bread, for a piece of bread, but don't go after the married women because then you could get, you lose your life. Yeah. You know, it's not really saying, you know, like, you know, the right thing, like it's don't do it because it's wrong. Well, many young people living in our day would consider this advice and these two chapters a way to kill a lot of fun in life. Isn't it kind of, I, I got the impression that maybe it's not all that way, but it's a sort of a dual theme. It sounds like a father giving his son some good advice, but then you read other, er, other areas in it, it's actually what God wants too. So there's sort of two streams of thought going mm -hmm. through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why do so many people think that sinning is fun? Of course, nobody here would think that, right? <laughs> we we sometimes sin. grudgingly sin, right? The devil made us do it. <laughs> the devil made us do it. What do you mean that sin is fun? Yeah. I asked you first. I mean... Why do, you, why, why do people sin? The person jumps off a building, it might be fun coming down, but you know that um, at the end... But that's not gonna... the usual kind of sins we're talking about. Well, isn't that what sin really is? I think it... Because, because you, you, you take it because you think it's good, but um, even though you're warned that at the end something's going to happen, mm -hmm. and um, you just disregard the warning at the end. So in a way, it is kind of like jumping off a building, enjoying yourself as you fall, free fall down, and, and not having any regard for hitting the ground. Some of us wouldn't enjoy that. Well, hitting even, the ground? Even, well, no, nobody no. does hitting the ground. No. Even, the, even the descent. <laughs> I, think, I think when people are young, as in pre-teens or teenagers, there's a certain amount of fun. All right, we're together. Mom and Dad aren't here. Let's go get something going here. Yeah. You might or you might not be aware of what you're doing, and there's a whole strata of society around the world that probably have no clue. Yeah. When you get older, you get a little smarter. What, is, um, <laughs> what do you think of these words from our Bible study guide? When a religious person is tempted, the greatest temptation is to find a religious reason to justify the iniquity. Mm -hmm. Using God to rationalize bad behavior is not only a terrible form of blasphemy, it's powerfully deceptive. After all, if someone thinks that God is with me, then what can you say in reply? This can happen even in cases of adultery. God has shown me that this man or woman, f fill in the blank, is the one I should be with. If that's what they believe, who or what can trump what God has shown them, quote unquote. <coughs> yeah, especially when I know it, and you're doing it wrong, and I'm telling you you're doing it wrong. 
But mm -hmm. not only do I know it, but God has told me. That's right. So that's even stronger. <coughs> I think you ought to be carried out and whipped. <laughs> it depends what voice you're listening to, though, doesn't it? <laughs> well, uh, let's, let's be honest. Satan is going to use every kind of attraction, every kind of deception that he can possibly dream up, especially as we approach the end of this world, Earth's history. There is, I mean, he's going to pull out all the stops. Could spiritual reasons ever be used to give us excuses for moral improprieties? We just talked about possibly. I mean, can, have any of you heard of people who've t tried to do that? I think of a famous, yes, a famous TV evangelist not too far from here who claimed, I sinned under the blood. But God's law turns out to be not negotiable. It is simple, straightforward, and universally applicable. Now, when we say that, we have to be careful. I know of examples where one part of God's law may come in conflict with another part. This sometimes happens in the field of medicine where I practice. Um, one of the worst examples of that, which happens once in a while, is you get a woman who, for example, has a serious heart condition and then she gets pregnant. And her heart has to produce 30 or 40 percent more blood flow to, to support a pregnancy. And if her heart's just not capable of doing that, then what do you do? You abort the baby and kill the baby, or do you let her go ahead with the very distinct possibility that mother and baby will die? This is not a class on ethics, but there are times when those kind of issues come up. Well, so sometimes you have to choose between bad and worse. Yes. Yeah. Look at Proverbs 6, verses 20, uh, 30 and 31. People don't despise a thief if he steals food when he's hungry. Yet if he is caught, he must pay back seven times more. He must give up everything he has. What is that suggesting? If you're, if you want, if you're really hungry, you better be a, a really clever thief. Don't get caught while you eat. Don't get caught while you eating. Or make sure you have nothing when you do it, because then they can't take anything away. Put you in jail. You know. I. It's interesting to notice that this, those two verses, um, dealing with theft immediately follow these verses, starting with verse 24. Can I ask you a question before yeah. you say that? Was, is there some basis in the law of Moses, in the first five books, that says anything about if someone who has nothing or who's hungry steals food, what's to be done with him? Okay, well, it's in our lesson, in our Bible study guide. And by the way, if, if you're interested in getting some of these materials that we use, they're available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And of course, what was supposed to happen in the ancient Jewish society? Everyone if, was supposed to be taken care of. Yeah, if you, were, if you were hurting, if you were poor, your neighbors were supposed to help you. Your fellow Christians were supposed to, or not Christians, Jews in that case, were supposed to take care of you. This wasn't supposed to happen. Um, so that was the was supposed to be the protection back in those days. But it still did say that if you're caught, you have to pay. And if you can't pay, you're sold into slavery. That's what happened. So now look, look back a few verses earlier, starting with verse 24. Chapter 6, Proverbs 6, verse 24. It can keep you away from... Well, just look at verse 23 so you can see what's leading up to this. Their instructions, talking about wisdom and talking about God's Word are a shining light. Their correction can teach you how to live. It can keep you away from bad women, from the seductive words of other men's wives. Don't be tempted by their beauty. Don't be trapped by their flirting eyes. A man can hire a prostitute for the price of a loaf of bread. You commented about that. But adultery will cost him all he has. 
Can you carry fire against your chest without burning your clothes? Can you walk on hot coals without burning your feet? It is just as dangerous to sleep with another man's wife. Whoever does it will suffer. He doesn't beat around the bush too much, does he? Is there, is there, some, is there a reason why he talks about theft and adultery sort of side by side? It's sort of the same kind of thing. You take, you know, using something that's not yours. Mm -hmm. yeah. Going after something that doesn't belong to you. Yeah, pe people that are married, they're, they're taken for. They're, they're, are <laughs> they're spoken for. Oh, they're not, spoken for. Well, not just spoken for, but they're they are possessed by somebody else. Yes. And you don't want to, you don't want to do something to some person that's possessed by somebody else. It, the, the passage goes on to say if a husband finds out about it, he will be very angry. Is that the, is that the biggest thing to worry about if you're carrying on with somebody else's wife? Back then it must have been. <laughs> Verse 32, he who commits adultery has no sense. Yeah. And he just, excuse me, and he who does it destroys himself. So yeah. it's self-destruction. Yeah. In my translation, it says, For jealousy makes a man furious, and he will not spare when he takes revenge. Yeah. Puts it plain enough. Mm hmm Well, look at these words from Ellen White. Now, is, is if we sin, if we offend God, is he the one that, is his anger what we have to worry most about? Well, Let's think about that for a moment. What, what, what's wrong with sin? Is it, I mean, and this is a, you know, when people look at it, huh? I mean, what's wrong with sin? Of course, sin is the worst thing that can happen, right? No, seriously, because there are two very, very different views about what's wrong with sin. One view is it makes God angry, and he's determined to get you because you're a sinner. That's one view, and you know that's stated in different kinds of ways, but that's in essence what it says. The other view is that sin is really bad because it damages you. And it, gradually, if we keep persisting in it, it, it makes us unfit to go to heaven. This does not say anywhere that God is angry. No, it doesn't. It says a man has no sense. Yeah. It's destroying him. Destroying himself. Yeah. Yeah. Ellen White has some interesting words to say in the book Education, page 150. The strongest bulwark, think about this one, this is scary. The strongest bulwark of vice in our world is not the iniquitous life of the abandoned sinner or the degraded outcast. It is that life which otherwise appears virtuous, honorable, and noble, but in which one sin is fostered, one vice indulged. He who, endowed with high conceptions of life and truth and honor, does yet willfully transgress one precept of God's holy law, has perverted his noble gifts into a lure to sin. A little well, bit of devil's advocate. Yeah, that's... Doesn't, didn't David, for example, when David went after Bathsheba, and not only did he want Bathsheba, but he was willing to kill the husband to get her. Mm -hmm. But not then, David is said to be um, a man after God, God's own heart. Of course, if you go to the writings of Ellen White, she says that was a description of David when he was still herding sheep out in the, <coughs> in the pasture. <laughs> Probably not about the point where he's... Um, but she does say, however, that when David fully repented and wrote those psalms of repentance and so forth and came back, he was once again a man after God's own heart. So, what about this issue? Is it, is it ever right? Is it ever, well, is, ever, is, it ever, is there ever a time when it's right to steal? If you're really hungry, for example? Well, look at these, you know, you asked Gordon a little while ago, but what is, what is, the, you know, the Pentateuch, what does the books of Moses say? If someone steals a cow or a sheep and kills it or sells it, he must pay five cows for one cow and four sheep for one sheep. He must pay for what he stole. If he owns, if he owns nothing, he should be sold as a slave to pay for what he has stolen. If the stolen animal, whether a cow, a donkey, or a sheep, is found alive in his possession, he shall pay two 
4, 1. But that's not all. Look at this. If you go over to Deuteronomy 15, 7 and 8, if any of the towns in the land that the Lord your God is giving you there is a fellow Israelite in need, then do not be selfish and refuse to help him. Instead, be generous and lend him as much as he needs. So there would be no reason for theft if they were really practicing that, right? So they're not practicing that, which causes the theft. And uh, isn't, that, isn't that what seems to be implied? But then, then the people who, are, who aren't doing that, they're the ones that should be punished. But the guy that's stealing, because they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, is the one that gets punished. Well, he's doing what, he, what he's doing is not right. Well, that's now, true. But he's not the only one that's doing wrong. Yeah. But this implies that the, the people, the thieves, are only people with nothing. There are people who have a lot. Yeah. And still, and still. But the one, okay, that's true. But um, if you're saying that if if the ones that have a lot should be given things to people that have nothing, that's in order to keep them from stealing, if they go ahead and steal anyway because these people aren't given to them, mm -hmm. well then the people that steal are the ones that are getting punished, not the ones that that should be it's given. Should things. be helping them, yes. I mean, that I would, seems I would, a little weird man, to me. By man's law. But again, you go back to sin being stupid, essentially, and that you're hurting yourself. So the person that isn't giving as he should to his fellow man is hurting himself by being selfish. So is, is sin really actions, or is it really being separated from God? I think you know the answer to that, but... But it the, seems like yeah. that's what we're talking about. We're well, trying to judge, you know, this action versus that action. Well, and and the you're reason, looking at the action as actually being the sin. And the reason that we do that is because we know that being separated from God leads to actions. And it's, I can't look at you and say, hmm, he's a sinner. I can only tell that by your behavior. So the Bible... That's why in the Ten Commandments... There's, a, there's a, a death penalty for the, for the breaking of every one of the Ten Commandments except number 10. And why is that? It goes on in your mind. You can't, number 10 goes on in the mind. You can't tell when somebody's, you know. So, so that one you don't have to get killed on? Well, it just means, that, no, the, you know, the obvious reason is that because there's no way to, to judge that. It leads to action. But why, did, why does Paul say that everyone has sinned? even the good person. And he talks specifically about the Tenth Commandment in Romans 7. Which, okay, so yeah. aren't we going, kind of going in circles here? Not no. really answering anything? No, I, I think we're, I think we're, we're, okay. we're dealing with a problem. Okay. Here in Proverbs, after talking about adultery and talking about theft, he goes straight back to adultery again. Look at Proverbs 6, verses 32 to 35. But a man who commits adultery hasn't any sense. He is just destroying himself. Now we said, what's the problem with sin? It's self-destructive, right? He will be dishonored and beaten up. He will be permanently disgraced. A husband is never angrier, angrier than when he is jealous. His revenge knows no limits. He will not accept any payment. No matter amount of gifts will satisfy his anger. I wonder what he does with his wife. Yeah. Well, the consequences, though, that you just read there is probably from his, from the husband. Mm -hmm. that so, that's, and that's my question. Is that the most dangerous thing? But we, we just read the person who does that, it's not just what the husband does to him. What is he doing? He is damaging himself. Is that what it says? Mm-hmm. It sounds he's like he's damaging it. himself that's because his husband's going to beat him up. <laughs> well, look that's at, what look it at, sounds like the damage no, is coming that's from. That's the next verse. It's not even. No, it, <laughs> it doesn't. Look at verse, the end of verse 32. He is just destroying himself. Yeah, he that's is. Not, that's not. Because if you go and that's not get the husband's wife, you're going to have, you're going to have the husband get it after you, going okay, after but, you. But that's the husband destroying you. 
Well, well that's what it's saying. Okay. No, it's not. It's saying you're destroying yourself before the husband, even even if the husband doesn't know about it. Well, well I don't know. I think I think all the stuff that during written during this time, it was a man's world. Yeah. Absolutely. You you can't <laughs> deny that. And if it's really a man's world, even more of a man's world than it is today, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard for us to kind of see what the thing is really talking about here. But even, but well, even if the guy survived the husband's uh, assaultive ministration, shall we say, the, the guy's ruined his reputation. Well, that's what forever. verse 73 says. That's yeah. right. It's right there. So either way, well, he's in nobody's trouble. Nobody's husbands are going to let that guy around. That's going to yeah, ruin well, his separate well, reputation. Well, nobody will want him near them. <laughs> well, and now we have to ask the more basic question, is the most dangerous aspect of sin that God finds out about it, he becomes angry? That's, that's what we're talking about here. Okay? I think he's more disappointed in the long run. We so get judged your, by it. To answer your question, no, God's anger is not what we have to fear. Yeah. We have to fear well, separation here's, from God. Here's Ellen White's comment, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 308, verses uh, I'm sorry, paragraph 6 and 7. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Here's their comments on the Ten Commandments. This commandment forbids not only acts of impurity, but sensual thoughts and desires or any practice that tends to excite them. Purity is demanded not only in the outward life, but in the secret intents and emotions of the heart. Christ, who taught the far-reaching obligation of the law of God, declared the evil thought or look to be as truly sin as is the, the unlawful deed. So what is an evil thought or look? Okay, now let's be honest. I mean, we, we, we try to pussyfoot around this. I mean, rubber bands can be advertised with bikini-clad women. You know, I mean, they, our world, I mean, you, what, what isn't advertised that way? So how we, how we, you know, is, does this mean that it's impossible to avoid enticements to sin? What, what's going on here? We, we live in a world that's steeped in and awash in sin. Do we need to go back to the uh, bruised and bleeding Pharisees thing? <laughs> that's silly. <laughs> <laughs> that's silly. Because if it's once you think it, it's like that, that's silly. That doesn't even make any sense. Me anyway. You know, when all this happens, doesn't it just prove that we're not God? Well, I didn't think that was too hard to prove. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it comes back to my question: um, Is the Ten Commandments is that God's law or is it our law? It's the law. Oh, it's, yeah, it's the way things work. Yeah, it's a description of how things really work. No, 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 no. <laughs> Come yeah. on, you guys. Ask the question. Answer the question. Is it our law or is it God's it law? Was, it, it's God's law which he gave to, to us. us. So it's a law that is intended for our purpose. Nobody has, nobody of us has kept the law perfectly. That's what Paul says. Obviously. So yeah. obviously he hasn't given it to us yet. No. It's running the universe. It's been there so far back. You well, God's imagine. running the universe. You're right. Well, let and me. The law is about God. That's what let, it is. Let me ask you the question this way: What does it take to convince us that sin is deadly? Probably, God leaving. <laughs> That'll convince us real fast. I mean. And there's none of us that can deny the fact that that we have some sin that's attractive and pleasant to us. You, know, you already said a moment ago, Paul made it very clear that we're all sinners. We're attracted by something that would be regarded as sinful. Each one of us. Different things. Some but more than one. Some more than one thing, right? <laughs> so has Satan hijacked good things designed by God to promote his agenda? Absolutely. Aren't men and women supposed to be attracted to each other? I, I, there wouldn't be any marriages, I guess, yeah, if we weren't. That would be my point about the look and all that. Because when you first met your wife, you, you don't see somebody and say, Oh my God, she disgusts me. Okay, let's get married. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way You're at right. All. You're absolutely right. <clears throat> Something I've pondered here, and I'm sure we all have, 
and you kind of indirectly touched on it just a minute ago. When you think of what we see in the papers, any form of media, mm -hmm. how really could Christ have been exposed to that? I know they had their rough equivalents, but nothing on the on the scale. size of what the scale of what we have today. Yes, they had yeah. their dancing girls and the gladiators and the, the jeweled women and all this, but mm -hmm. you can't help but wonder. Well, let me ask my question in a slightly different way. Every time you're tempted, do you immediately think, okay, this could lead to death? Mm. Well, it depends I, what. I, if you were a diabetic, overweight, had a heart problem so you couldn't exercise and there's a table full of the wrong things it's the same type of temptation as a man or a woman looking at something they shouldn't be looking at mm -hmm. I mean it's that overwhelming desire yes it'll kill me but I want it anyway yeah well let's just think about this for a moment if you could spend a full 24-hour period watching the most popular channels on television, you would probably see hundreds of examples of adultery and other related iniquities. Murders, thousands. maybe thousands. Yeah. Um, so well, Are those things going to grab you and throw you to death? Well, the question is how, you do, how do you relate to them? How do you relate to them? Yeah. In the long run, so certain things could, yeah. But, but look, look, let's, let's, let's stick with our text in the Bible. Look at Proverbs 7. Um, and I, I guess we'll start with, <coughs> probably should start with verse 6. Once I was looking out the window of my house, and I saw many inexperienced young men, but noticed one foolish fellow in particular. He was walking along the street near the corner where a certain woman lived. He was passing near her house in the evening after it was dark, and then she met him. She was dressed like a prostitute and was making plans. She was, she was a bold and shameless woman who always walked the streets or stood waiting at a corner, sometimes in the streets, sometimes in the marketplace. She drew, threw her arms around the young man, kissed him, and looked him straight in the eye and said, I made my offerings today and have the meat from the sacrifices. So I came out looking for you. I wanted to find you, and here you are. I've covered my bed with sheets of colored linen from Egypt. I've perfumed it with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come on, let's make love all night long. We'll be happy in each other's arms. My husband isn't at home. He's gone away on a long journey. He took plenty of money with him and won't be back for two weeks. So she talked, tempted him with her charms, and he gave in to her smooth talk. Suddenly he was going with her like an ox on the way to be slaughtered, like a deer prancing into a trap where an arrow would pierce its heart. He was like a bird going into a net he did not know that his life was in danger. That's a pretty graphic description, wouldn't you say? Not much has changed, has it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it made the point that she was married. I yes. wonder if it would have been the same thing if she wasn't married. Well, it's interesting that if you go back to the, the description, I mean, the directions from Moses, mm -hmm. if a person commits adultery, both the, the man and the woman are both supposed to be killed. If you commit adultery or, or if you have intercourse with a, with a woman who's not married, you have to marry her. No being around the bush was her. So that situation would have been okay if she wasn't married because after they got done, well, then the guy would have had to marry her. Presumably. So then everything's fine. But that well. So it w it's not fine in, in our standards today, but it sounds like back then it would have been. That, that was commonplace. The men would get a bunch of wives. They have two shows. We're talking about television. They have two shows on television now. One is a man with four wives. The other one is one with five. Mm. And and the five, they pretty much sleep in the same, and they're religious. It's, it's because of their religion. They are Mormons. And mm. it's very popular show. One have 21 children between the four. The other one, it, it's a popular show. You watch every week. It's 
it, and it's like no one cares. It makes me sick. I don't get it. Well, I could tell you lots of interesting stories from Africa where I lived in a society where polygamy was accepted, very much accepted in some tribes. In fact, the more wives you are, the, the wealthier you were considered to be. Um, well, we do not know when this particular passage was actually written. Was it before Solomon had his 700 wives and 300 concubines? Were those 1,000 women in constant competition for his attention? Is that what led to his writing this passage? Boy, I, I, I can't imagine that. I cannot imagine it. Stand in line, right? Oh, man. <laughs> wow. I can't deal with one. <laughs> in a larger sense, surely this enticing woman represents temptation in all its form. And, of course, the, if we had time to talk about it, and we're running out of time already, if, this is talking about spiritual adultery of all, in all kinds of forms, I'm sure. Look at these. The righteousness of Christ will not cover one cherished sin. Christ Topic Lessons 316, paragraph 2. Again, if one sin is cherished in the soul or one wrong practice is retained in the life, the whole being is contaminated. Man becomes an instrument of unrighteousness. Desire of Ages, page 313. Even one more, five, volume 5 of the Testimonies, pages 53, paragraph 2. Even one wrong trait of character, one sinful desire cherished, will eventually neutralize all the power of the gospel. The prevalence of a sinful desire shows the delusion of the soul. Every indulgence of that desire strengthens the soul's aversion to God. The pains of duty and the pleasures of sin are the cords with which Satan binds men in his snares. And let's remember, what did it say about Moses in, in, in Hebrews 11? He chose to avoid the pleasures of sin. He chose rather to suffer persecution with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin. For a time. For a time. Those who would rather die then perform a wrong act are the only ones who will be found faithful. That's, a, that's pretty scary. Well, the Bible illustrates the fact that some very important people have fallen into temptation. I mean, David, who wrote many of the Psalms, and Solomon, who wrote many of the Proverbs, are certainly examples. And what about Saul, the first king, who was given a new heart? And again, I would like to quote one more passage from Ellen White. This one's found from found in volume four of the Testimonies, uh, page 495. Satan offers to men the kingdoms of the world if they will yield to him their suprem the supremacy. Many do this and sacrifice heaven. It is better to die than to sin. Better to want than to defraud. Maybe that's a comment about whether it's all right to steal if you're hungry. Better to hunger than to lie. Let all who are tempted meet Satan with these words. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways, for thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Here is a condition and a promise which will be unmistakably realized. Happiness and, the prosper and prosperity will be the result of serving the Lord. And one more. Choose poverty, reproach, separation from friends or any suffering rather than to defile the soul with sin. Death before dishonor or the transgression of God's law should be the motto of every Christian. As a people professing to be reformers, treasuring the most solemn, purifying truths of God's word, we must elevate the standard far higher than it is at the present time. And that was back in Ellen White's day, before there was radio, before there was television, before there was any of those things. Christians should all know that our continual focus, focus of attention should be on Jesus Christ. Focusing on one's sins is a deadly trap because by beholding we become changed. Great Controversy 555 and 2 Corinthians 318. And whatever form it takes, sin must be avoided. Do some of these quotations sound like fanaticism? If we believe God's word and try to follow it precisely, are we falling into legalism? I mean, would God be that strict? 
or does he recognize how dangerous sin is really? And my question again, do we really believe that sinning leads to death? We know what the Bible says, but in practical day-by-day -day living, do we really believe it? What is the relationship between God's character of love and his law? If God is infinitely forgiving, do we really need to worry about obeying his law? Won't he always forgive our transgressions? In your daily Christian life, have you found that following God's directions leads to the most happiness? Are God's rules always for our best good? Wow. Proverbs 6 and 7 are explicit about the dangers of adultery. And I, I would say I think it's probably also true about spiritual adultery. Considering that the average American male aged 25 to 44 has had 6.1 sexual partners, and the average American female of these, those ages has had 3.6. This is a serious issue. How many Americans would still be alive if we enforce the rules in Leviticus 20.10? Let me show you those as we're running out of time here. <clears throat> Leviticus 20.10 says, If a man commits adultery with the wife of a fellow Israelite, both he and the woman shall be put to death. Bang. That's the end of that problem, right? <laughs> Wash your hands, right. What about Deuteronomy 22, verses 22? Gordon asked about this, or one of you asked about this a little earlier. If a man is caught having intercourse with another man's wife, both of them are to be put to death, and this way you will get rid of this evil. Now, um, yeah, out of time. Running out of time, unfortunately. As parents, do we live in our God, out God's principles clearly before our children? Parents must live exemplary lives in order to be good examples to their children. Do as I say and not as I do never <coughs> works very well. God's law is described as a lamp. And certainly, he loves to purify people. He would love to put a pure heart in, in every one of us. We need to practice following his example. And by beholding, we can become changed. But we don't live in a world that makes that easy. It's a challenge for us as Christians to stand out from the worldly traditions and customs. Our kind and loving Father, we've talked about some very serious matters. May they be understood as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.